can't find nothing on the radio. Ready, Steve? Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Welcome to Songology. He's Bruce. He's Richard. And this is another episode from our Song of the Day archives. Enjoy. Welcome back, Bruce. It's a short week. What are we doing this week? This week, you're going to spend some time with some very bad men. Oh. Yes. Okay. Dangerous characters. It's kind of a wretched hive of scum and villainy, I guess. We're going Following. to Ottawa? <laughs> yeah, this, the Ottawa Senate. <laughs> Hi, Mike Duffy. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Songs about really, really bad men. For example, Maxwell Edison. Now, you remember Maxwell Edison, don't you? No. Maxwell Edison, who majors in medicine? He's a medical student with a penchant for murder. Ah, in okay. Quite the happiest, jauntiest little tune about a serial killer that you'll ever hear. That would be The Beatles with Maxwell Silver Hammer. Ah, Okay. Right. Yeah. Now, as I say, it's a jaunty little tune. It's very like a lot of old British music halls. And really, the only rock bands that ever really got into that and sort of embraced that part of the musical heritage were the Beatles and the Kinks, really, were the only two bands that really got into that. But things like Penny Lane and When I'm 64 and these sorts of things really harken back to that music hall tradition. And most of them are either written outright by or heavily contributed to by Paul McCartney. In fact, although the credit for this song is always, as they all almost always were, it says Lennon McCartney on it. This is 100 percent Paul McCartney's tune. And in fact, John Lennon doesn't even play on this track. Huh. He was there, and we'll, yep. we'll get we'll get to John and his his possible contribution in a minute or two here. But this was purely Paul's project. His family, when he growing up, they used to amuse each other by telling outlandish, outrageous stories that they would just sort of make up on the spot. He says that this grew out of that. It was basically Maxwell Silverhammer was his analogy for something going wrong just out of the blue, right? You're sailing yeah. along, everything's great, and then suddenly in comes Maxwell with the hammer and bang, everything's wrecked, yeah. right? And he says that he still, for years afterwards, used that expression around the house or whatever when something goes wrong. Yeah. He wrote the song in late 1968. They were just finishing up the self-titled album that everybody refers to as the White Album. Yes. And he brought it in, but it was too late to be in, to even yeah. considered for inclusion. And so in early 69, when they were working on the project that ultimately became the Let It Be album, Yeah. McCartney brought it in again, and he had them rehearse it. And there's film, because you got to remember that what ultimately turned into the Let It Be album, remembering that Let It Be, though released last, was not the last Beatles album recorded. Right. So because the Let It Be album was conceived as both a film and a record album, there's film of them rehearsing it. Yes. All calling out the chord changes and different things. And their roadie and uh, road manager and so forth, a guy by the name of Mal Evans, playing, or not so much playing, is banging on an anvil in time with the yep. music. And so yep. forth. Now, the other Beatles hated this song. <laughs> I think that that's fair to say. They really, really didn't like it. And so it didn't make it into, I mean, Let It Be, with the whole thing was just sort of shelved. And then later on, in 69, they went back into the studio again to make what was the Abbey Road album. And of course, here comes Paul with his pet song again, the, the yeah, thing that, yeah. and he's just determined to make this thing a single. It was never released as a single, despite Paul's best efforts, because he could never convince the other Beatles that it was worthy of being a single. George Harrison described it as a fruity song. He's a it, fruity it, song. Yes. In an interview, he said, sometimes Paul would make us do these really fruity songs. I mean, my God, Maxwell Silverhammer was so fruity. And after a while, we did a good job on it. But when Paul got an idea in his head, you couldn't stop him, basically. And Ringo said the worst session ever was Maxwell Silverhammer. It was the worst track we ever had to record. It went on for weeks. Now, he added a few expletives that I've deleted. Yeah. Yep. So I thought it was mad. Now, actually, it wasn't weeks at all. It was three days. Okay. <laughs> but again, I'll get to that in a minute. It felt like weeks. 
Well, it seemed to, right? John says, oh, yeah, this this is Paul's. I hate it. All I remember is he made us do it 100 million times. He did everything to make it into a single, and it never was. It never could have been. But he was doing all these things. He had somebody banging in iron pieces. We spent more money on that song than any of them in the whole album, I think. Well, actually, John, you didn't even play on it, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what you're complaining about, right? Yeah. It took three sessions to record. Now, there was another session where Paul played a Moog synthesizer, which was a new thing at the time. Yeah. But he did that on his own. That was an overdub, right? Yeah. So they actually, because you can find uh, virtually everything about the Beatles ever, if you want to burrow around on the Internet long enough. I can tell you that this is Paul and George and Ringo. They recorded this in 21 takes. Okay. Yeah. 21 takes in the studio. Paul added a piano overdub. George Martin added a Hammond organ. And they brought in an anvil from a theatrical supply place, and Ringo banged the anvil. So that was essentially it. Now, John, weird little moment about John. John doesn't appear on the song. The first day that they went in to record it, that was his first day back in the studio. He'd been in the hospital. He and Yoko, who he had married in March of 69, they had been in Scotland and they were in a car crash. Oh, Uh, And Yoko actually was pregnant at the time and she had been ordered to have complete bed rest. So John didn't like to leave Yoko at the best of times, right? Yeah. And so John has a bed brought into the studio. Here we are. We're setting up the microphones for the session and so forth. And suddenly here comes a moving van a van with a double bed. And they roll it into the studio. And an ambulance brings Yoko in. She's loaded into the bed. So the techs set up a mic over her in case she wants to participate and say something. And then we all carry on as before. And the techs are saying, well, they were basically saying to themselves, well, we've seen it all now. <laughs> And there was an engineer, a guy by the name of Ron Richards, who popped into one of the sessions and he sees, well, there's Yoko Ono laying there in a double bed. And he says, what the heck is this? What's going on? But he, he can't believe it. But he says, John was sitting noodling around at the organ and John was very, very touchy about this. Yeah. And so when the engineer, what the heck is going on here? And John is more than a little prickly about it. So he says, I just kept quiet and walked out. <laughs> I go uh-huh. right. So twenty-one takes, right? Yeah. They're complaining about it bitterly, absolutely bitterly, as I've said. But I point out something, and that is to George, I would say, you know, George, to do while my guitar gently weeps took twenty-five takes, and to John, I would point out, Strawberry Fields took twenty-six, and to Ringo, who complained the loudest, oh, Mister, it went on for weeks. Yeah. Octopus's Garden that Ringo wrote took 32 takes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, you know, I have to come to Paul's defense a little bit here. Yeah. But in in some ways, it actually, the fact that they're complaining about it, and it's not a difficult song, it's not terribly complex, it actually illustrates, I think, quite nicely the fact that at this stage in their careers, the Beatles were really tired and really sort of worn out. Well, you guys have just spent too much time together, and you're yeah. getting on each other's nerves all the time. And dealing However, with the Beatles machine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. However, it, as I said, it's the happiest little song about a serial murder you're going to hear. And they still, notwithstanding all of the difficulties and the acrimony and so forth, they still had a little bit of fun. If you listen carefully, and I hadn't really noticed this until I started listening to it again to prepare for doing this. If you listen carefully, about a minute and a half in, Paul laughs when he's singing the line, writing 50 times, I must not be so, right? Uh Just ever so slightly a laugh at the beginning of that. And so I wondered, well, what's the deal? And of course, you say you can find anything out about the Beatles you ever want to know. It is rumored, it has never been confirmed, but it is rumored that it was at that moment that John actually mooned Paul while he was singing. (laughs) Because the line prior to writing 50 times I must not be so is, he waits behind, right? Uh So John drops his pants. (laughs) <laughs> that was his contribution to the song and so you get this little laugh in there yeah, so they're yeah, still yeah. trying to have a little bit of fun one more thing i'm going to mention and that how did it do when it came out oh it was never released as a single okay 
Yeah, Paul never was successful in getting it to be a single. Yeah. It was played by DJs anyway, but yes. it never charted. Never charted. Okay, because I know I've heard it quite a few times. Oh, yeah, I know it shows that, up. So it's quite popular, but... And it, 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 is a, uh, it is a favorite of Betty's. So if you're out there, Betty, this one is for you. Here's Maxwell's Silver Hammer. Joan was quizzical. And as usual, I have to stop it right there due to the wonderful world of fair use rules. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe. You can visit us on Facebook or head over to our website, songology.ca. Now, here's your chance to listen to the music or go on to the next episode.